Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. So get this, I'm searching on reverb, always looking for some cool stuff for the show, either to talk about it, buy, review, and demo. I'm a daily upload channel, you always gotta have fresh content, right? And I stumble upon this thing. Gibson Explorer 1958 Natural Custom 2008 Reissue. With a price tag like that, it's gotta be good. Let's check this thing out. So obviously, the elephant in the room, this thing has a really weird exotic top to it. It kind of reminds me of like the zebra wood Les Pauls. You can also find some Firebirds done up very similarly. But I don't think that's exactly what this is. It just has a very unique wood grain that you don't see on electric guitars too often. I mean, it kind of reminds me of like a barn door or like an old kitchen table. So that gave this thing some style points. I mean, add on the fact that we've got a TP6 tailpiece and an ABR1 bridge, that means it's definitely built to like 58 historic specs, so we can probably expect a long neck tendon in here. But then, to give this thing a little bit more edge, we've got a black pick guard with uncovered humbuckers. I mean, had they just had gold covers on there and a cream pick guard, it would have changed the entire vibe of this thing. I think both would have looked nice. And the reflector bonnet knobs just work well with this whole theme. So with the title of Gibson Explorer, I was kind of hoping this was a real Gibson, right? However, I've never actually seen a real explorer like this. We swap over to this photo, you can actually see it's like a natural binding. Like at first I just thought it was a cream binding. So if this was a real custom order and it looks like this, that would be quite fantastic, right? But then I got to this photo and it's like, yeah, no. <laughs> There's gotta be a story behind this thing. It's not a Gibson factory original looking like this. Because first off, this truss rod cover. <laughs> it's terrible. It's awful. Seller of the guitar, please replace that with something that looks better because that just looks like a cheap Gibson product. Something this custom out of the custom shop wouldn't have a rinky dinky Gibson silk screen on it. This kind of reminds me, especially with this case in the background, of like a 1984 Explorer, you know, the alder bodied ones. James Hetfield's really known for using one of those. However, even that, the logo just isn't quite in the right place as compared to where the real ones would be. And the font just isn't quite right, so that looks like some sort of like a an aftermarket decal. So that's two strikes against this being a factory original. And then we get to the back and it's like, oh, well, first off, our tuners are missing their screws. Not that you actually need them to make them function. It's just good to have them there so you can make sure that they line up straight. But then we have the serial number, A2659. That's not your usual Gibson serial number style. Now granted, for a very short period of time in 1975, Gibson serial numbers did start with a letter. A good example of this is a Les Paul artisan I once documented. How do you know you have one of the first 100 or so artisans? It's because they start with a C. Sometimes you find a different letter, but right before they switched over to the whole decal serial number system, you start to see some of those. And in the Heritage series, you could find things like this as well. For example, we'll take a look at this Karina Flying V because the Heritage series explorers are ridiculously rare. But they have a leading letter, I think it's A through G is the latest number I've ever seen. And then they have three digits. That makes it really hard to date other than looking at pot codes, but at least you know it's within the general era of those things being created, the early 80s. But you can see the font of this one compared to that one, and yeah, something's not quite up there. We've got an extra digit. So that's a third strike against this guitar, where I'm thinking, okay, wh what really is this? But then I saw this badge. Oh, that looks kind of official, but this also has our answer right here. 50 years of the Gibson Explorer, Customized by Tony Fritzy, 2008. Okay, so this is a potentially real Gibson electric guitar. Now, I want to be abundantly clear. If you're interested in purchasing this, I cannot tell you it's actually a Gibson product based on these photos, but it is entirely possible if everything was redone. So I think that's what the seller was trying to convey with custom right here, but I really think you should put modified, you know, by Tony Fritzy. Let's see, how famous is this guy? Unfortunately, a quick Google search doesn't pull anything up, but that doesn't mean that he's not locally known somewhere. So for 7,500, I would probably suggest staying away from it until many more questions have been answered. Because four photos of a heavily modified guitar aren't enough to make any rational conclusions here. But it does look interesting. However, I think they're trying to say it was originally one of these that has been modified. And his ad said original case, and that doesn't seem to be true, and it's not like they copied over the original serial number from this one, because those didn't start with a letter. But let's move on to the next guitar we'll talk about tonight. Old Toilet Burst is back. A long time ago, I made a Would You Rock or Not video on this thing, saying this guy's either crazy or a marketing genius. 
Well, apparently it's still for sale here in the year 2022, so I think most people are turned off by this leading photo. You've got this beautiful, ultra, high-end guitar sitting on a toilet. <laughs> now granted, he's at least updated the photos a little bit, it looks like he has his own custom case for this thing now, but that leading photo, even though I still want to document one of these, just makes me not want to buy it. I'm sure you don't really want to know what people do with their guitars behind closed doors. Sometimes it's better just not to know. But I'm kind of surprised Reverb lets him get away with that photo. They've pulled listings for sillier things in the past. But for my whole satirical episode, just check it out right here. It's worth it to watch if you missed it the first time. Oh, and in case you are interested, he had it down to like 5400 at one point in time. So he's getting closer to that point where it just might sell. However, between the choice of that one and this one, even though this one's located in Italy, maybe it hasn't sat on a dirty toilet. <laughs> And now the last one for tonight comes from a viewer of the show. He sent this on my Instagram page and was like, hey, dude, you should check this thing out. It's the craziest 12 string I've ever seen. So it's called an ESP LTD XJ12. Apparently it's pretty popular in the 12 string world, number 56 on reverb. Let's see, it's kind of got like Jazz Master Jaguar vibes, except for the electronics seem to be fairly minimal. Maybe a three-way toggle switch right here for our two humbucker pickups extra space to part on those guys. And that's a pretty cool finish with that Perloid pick guard. And then it looks like maybe two knobs here for master volume, master tone, maybe even a coil splitter switch. I'm not sure. Hey, I was right. But I'm really impressed to find out Seymour Duncan pickups in this thing. Nice. Then it looks like we have some sort of a hardtail bridge. I would play a six string version of that. But obviously, as I told you before, it's a 12 string. So look at that headstock. They've just got tuners galore on this thing. Count them. Eight on this side and then four on that side. It's kind of like a blending between the options you have on a 12 string. Like there's the Rickenbacker style, there's the Gibson style with the obnoxiously long headstocks that are just normal in shape. And then you have Fender style. But this might be the smartest design out of all of them because sure, you still have the weird freaky headstock, but they've designed it in a way that is still visually pleasing to the eye despite being obnoxiously long. But I'd imagine it'd be a real pain to tune this because I always hate tuning this side of the tuners. And you've got more on that side than that side, but it's a perfect place right here for the LTD branding. But now with a quick Google search, there's actually other colors of these. So there's like a kind of a blue sparkle, more of an in-your-face blue sparkle with matching headstock, more of a red fireburst. And oh, cool, XJ6 is the six string version. I might have to check one of these things out. Looks like it's got Seymour Duncan mini humbuckers. It's a familiar shape, but just a little bit different enough to make it cool. And awesome, there's also ESP versions. Here's an obnoxious gold sparkle with matching headstock, which they also offer in six string variety. I don't know. I'm going to be on the lookout for one of these things. I think it's kind of cool. But it does not seem like too many of these things were ever made. And they're almost 10 years old now. I mean, even looking here on Reverb, we only have documented sales of two. From 700 to 600, it seems, you know, if you have one, you control the market. But now that I know that there's fancy sparkle versions, I, I think I might hold out for one of those. All right, I lied. I'll show you guys one more. So I get people all the time sending me these maple fretboarded Les Paul customs from the 70s. So I do want to clarify. I'm looking for a perfect condition one. Like there must be zero wear on that fretboard because that really bugs me on these maple finished guitars. And this one was close. Like I'll live with a little bit of tarnishing on the pickups because it'll eventually happen anyways. This one has a bit more than I would prefer. However, my jaw dropped when I got to the back of this one. Yeah, <laughs> a flamed maple neck. Now the maple neck is going to be standard in this era, but to have some flame figuring in it, you do not see that too often in the Norlin era. I mean, it's there, it does happen. It's not what I would call rare, rare, but to find one that has all pieces flamed is kind of cool. Now, granted this one, mainly only figured here and there and just semi what in the middle stripe because these are three piece maple necks but it looks like it would look pretty good in person and the headstock is extra clean but unfortunately that's what made me not buy this no we're not talking about the chip on the headstock that i'm just now seeing for the first time somebody took off the awesome Gibson branded Schaller tuners for these crappy Grovers. <laughs> Grover tuners, they are nice, but they ruined the look of these guitars. You can tell that those washers were much larger than the original Schaller ones. So despite this thing being clean, that one change just made me so upset. 
But now that I've seen some of those other chips, nicks, and dings, this would have disqualified me from wanting this anyways. And it looks like our pickups have been messed with too. So the hunt goes on for a perfect maple fretboarded custom to document. But this one is available if you're interested, 5,000 bucks. It is in good condition. It has the tuners that have been replaced so that either bothers you or not. I've been seeing these things sell for a lot more money recently though. Personally, I wouldn't suggest more than 45 if you really have to have it though. All right, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care.